Mr. Moggart, um, my first question is in your opening statement, Mr. Love, you were talking about um, a review of oversight and governance that was carried out in relation to the higher education sector or institutes generally. And uh, you mentioned a number of areas where there was a review of governance and so on. Uh, was intellectual property one of those areas, and specifically commercialising intellectual property? No, 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 and Deputy, not specifically not on that specifically. one. And can I ask why not? Uh, yes, okay, so sorry. Um, my understanding is that uh, the responsibility for intellectual property and setting up the guidelines and the way the system operates lies principally with Knowledge Transfer Ar Ireland, which is a component, if you like, funded by Enterprise Ireland, and that they set down through KTI, as it's called, the IP guidelines and local implementation for the for operation of IP policies of protection and exploitation at uh, our third level institution, the higher education institution. So that's why, if you like, another piece of the state, uh, I suppose, has responsibility for that, and that's why we kept it out. Well, I understand they have a responsibility, but in terms of protecting the interests of institutes and to make sure there is good practice and, and best practice in relation to commercialising intellectual property, just to work clear in terms of your own organisation's terms of reference. Are you telling me that you have no role whatsoever in relation to governance and oversight of governance in relation to intellectual property? I understand what the other agency's role is. I'm asking specifically now about yeah. your role and your agency's role. So does your organisation have any role? I suppose we're responsible for overall governance. Yes. And th therefore, uh, at times like the procurement review that's mentioned, we would pick specific instances that maybe, we, in our judgment, worth a, a specific probe or review. So to answer your question directly, I could imagine that if that became warranted, we could do, we could do so. And, well, I'm going to put a number of questions which would suggest you should do so. Okay. But before I do, um, when the Secretary General of the Department of Education was here last week, we had a discussion about spin-out companies uh, and uh, revenue that would accrue from those that would then go to institutes. So mm -hmm. it is one of the many revenue streams open to institutes of technology and to universities. You have acknowledged in your opening statement that some organisations, some institutes are in deficit, some of them very significant deficits. So obviously if there is the potential for revenue to accrue, we need to make sure that the institute is protected at all sure. uh, costs. So I did some desktop research on this uh, very cursory research, and if I was able to manage to do that, I'm just curious as to why the HEA have not done any work on this. And I've examined the national policy in the first instance. I've also examined the policy of various institutes of technology, and I haven't even got to the universities yet. And there are big gaps and variances in policy in terms of their robustness and who is accountable for what and decision-making and management of conflicts of interest. So I'm going to get to those in a second in okay. terms of give you some examples, but before I do, could you just comment on whether or not the HEA has done any look back in relation to uh, the potential differences in institutes, which you do have a responsibility for, yeah. uh, in terms of how they manage conflicts of interest? Yeah. When is the last time you carried out a review? You actually went to the trouble of getting all of the institutes intellectual property policies and measuring them to see which ones were most robust. If I can defer to my yeah. colleague Andrew Brownlee, please. Well, I, I suppose what we seek is obviously you have the national IP protocol um, and then it's the institution's responsibility, as you point out, to develop its own IP policy. What we seek for as the, the HEA in, in a role of, of governance in the sector is assurance that those policies are in place and are, are, are robust. And we also seek to ensure, and it's part of the requirements of the codes of government, that the institutes have codes of conduct for employees that cover conflict of interest um, and also limits on, on, on outside activities. And are you aware of any institute where there is a review of management of conflicts of interest? 
the review of management of conflict of interest in, in relation to intellectual property. Yes, I, uh, we're, we're aware of one. One, of one thing, which yeah. is, can you name the institute? We'd be aware that there is a review taking place in Waterford at the moment. Waterford. And how were you made aware of that? We, I, I understand from um, my colleagues and in the department that the chair of the governing body uh, instigated a review. I think on foot of some conversations here and elsewhere to make that review happen. Well, the review would have been instigated before there was any discussion at this committee. Okay. So. Um, I'm wondering what was the purpose of the review, and also, just to ho hold you there for a second. So, you're, this is the first time now this has been relayed to, to this committee. It was the president of the institute, from your understanding, who instigated this internal review. Is that correct? The chair of the governing body, I chair believe. Of the governing body. I, believe I thought, thought yes. you said the president. Sorry. No. Sorry. I thought you said the president. No, I said the chair of the governing chair body. Of the governing body. Yes. Okay. So the chair of the governing body has commissioned a review. Okay, and we'll have that instituted next week, and we'll find out precisely why. Why did this? Why was this review commissioned? Um, and we also heard as well from the Secretary General of the Department that the President of the Institute is not not in the position to uh, um, have any role in this review because he is part of the review, okay. which is, I would see, somewhat problematic. But. Um, if I can just come to the policy on it, because that's what I'm trying to get to here. Okay. I had signalled that the HEA should actually be represented at all of the meetings that take place with the uh, institutes that will be in the next week. I think somebody from the HEA should be there, which is standard practice. But in terms, uh, are we satisfied that there, you will have a representative Absolutely. at the meetings tomorrow Perfect. and next week? Yes. Right. Okay. So in terms of Waterford Institute of Technology and Intellectual Property Policy, the last time there was a review done, Mr. Love was in on the 23rd of February 2010, uh, and it goes on to say who the authors of the report were, and then the policy owner is the head of the Office of Head of Research and Innovation. Okay, so that would suggest to me, would it not, that the book then would stop with the head of research and innovation in relation to management of conflicts of interest, or at least they would have a, a very clear role. Would that not be correct? And if you can't answer that, maybe Mr. Brownlee can. Yeah, I, if I can take take that, uh, I don't know the specifics in, in this particular case, and I'm wary of making a comment until the report, uh, as commissioned, is out on, on the specifics and what are. But, but may I, can I make, can I make no, a no, more? No, I'm stop you there because this is what I was trying to avoid. Yeah. I'm not going to be stonewalled by anybody in relation to an ongoing review. I'm not asking questions about that. I'm asking questions about policy. So here's the policy here. Sure. It's Watford's policy, and. The policy owner is the Office of the Head of Research and Innovation. And what I'm asking you is not specific to any institute. Okay. I'm asking you, does the Head of Research and Innovation in an institute have a governance role in relation to the oversight of policy in respect of intellectual property? So this would not be unusual in these types of institutions, either nationally here in Ireland or internationally. That's what I wanted to say, bringing this out to the policy level and, and sector level that you will often have a case where IP policy in the main may be managed or controlled, if you like, by a head of research and innovation. But most of these institutions internationally and here will have a system or process available where if that particular individual is involved in a particular decision, they need to step aside. There's a very specific process or set of rules, if you like, for what is called managing potential conflicts of interest. It's quite, I guess, normal in certain scenarios for leaders in research fields. I worked in this field myself for a number of years um, to get into management positions and, and ergo then be in a position to be making decisions that might relate to particular pieces of research and their, the, the Well, I think there would be property. a distinction to be drawn from my perspective, and we may have disagreement in the department, certainly, and maybe from yourself as well, that in my view you should make a choice between innovation and being involved in the commercialising of intellectual property and being head of a department in an institute. But if I come to the uh, Waterford's policy again, what they have in place is what's called the commercialisation office, and that's what manages the interests of the institute. So the yeah. interests of the institute are managed through this office, yeah. and they make sure that when there is commercialisation <coughs> that the institute should be protected. Uh, and it says that the commercialisation office reports to the head of research and innovation. So the office would report to the head of research. Okay? It then goes on to say that the commercialisation committee is made up of the financial controller and the head of research and innovation. 
Now, if you, and I'm not talking about any specific institution, but if you were the head of research and innovation, and you were involved in, you were a director and shareholder in spin-out companies, you were also the person who is the policy owner of the intellectual property policy, you are the person upon which the commercialisation office reports back to, and you were also a member of the commercialisation committee. And I can put it to you that there is the potential here for ongoing conflicts of interest, and I'm not satisfied that there's an arm's length separation between the interests of an institution and the interests of individuals. And I accept in one institution there is a review. We'll see what comes out of that. But before you answer that question, are you satisfied that the person who's conducting this review in this institution has had no role in the past in relation to uh, the decision making in terms of the commercialising of intellectual property? Because that then will be a review of yourself. So are you satisfied that the person if, and I'm not sure if you're aware of the person, but the person who's conducting the review does not have any potential conflict here. I'm not aware that the person has a potential conflict of interest, but if I can relate it to your earlier question, Deputy, with your permission, yes. about this is a common challenge, can I put it this way, in, in research institutions and universities and institutes of technology in Ireland and across the globe, where you have to have processes that can manage that potential conflict of interest. And in the scenarios you mentioned there, where you might be reporting to someone, you might be the head of innovation, but also the researcher, there are well-established processes, and it is catered for in the IP pro uh, policy that we have here in Ireland, where you step aside and somebody else takes the role where the decision-making that might affect the particular piece of exploitation of IP. That is a well-established process internationally and here. And I'm not aware of the specifics in this individual case, but more generally, it is not unusual at all that you will find a situation where there is a potential conflict of interest from a researcher who is then in a management position. But you see, which, what I'm trying to draw a distinction between is researchers who have no role whatsoever in relation to government management and oversight, mm -hmm. and those who do. Mm -hmm. So if you have a role in relation to govern, governance, management and oversight, that should be your role. In other words, if you are head of research and innovation, your role should be exclusively to protect the interests of the institute and not having some of your time invested in personal companies or a personal interest in, in, in private companies which benefit from institutional resources and so on. And we can fundamentally disagree on that, yeah. right? But we'll get to the bottom of what happened in this uh, um, institute. If that person goes on to become president of the institute, then the president of the institute uh, would, that, would that person, if they were applying for the job, have to declare at interview stage that I'm a, a director and a shareholder in a number of companies co-located in the institute? Would that have to be declared as part of the interview proce process? I would imagine yes. I, I, Not I, imagine. I, I I'm asking so. you, I, is it I, a requirement? Do you know? If you don't know, it's fair enough. I, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know this. But, but I'd like to stress that it, you know, and I go back to this. I'm sorry if I'm going back to this, but I do, having 10 years' experience in research, funding and innovation, mm -hmm. It is not uncommon, in fact, it, it happens quite regularly that individual researchers who've got to the point of having some intellectual property that the, their home institution wishes to exploit for yeah. the good of the institution and the researchers and the, the people in the area, that they are then in management positions, that there then is a potential conflict of interest and that they openly declare that and then that is managed by an exception process in that institution, very often involving that person stepping to the side and another senior person stepping in to the process of decision-making with regard to that particular... And we'll find out if that happens. Sure, yeah, yeah, again, I, I don't I know, but that is very I'm much... putting a, a number of questions called to you, so I, I do accept okay. that, and it was only in policy terms I was asking questions. I just want to move on to the um, uh, financial statements of institutions and whether the timeliness of the... Uh, accounts being presented and the audits being done and um, can you first of all outline to us how many institutes of technology are in deficit? I think and I'll, I'll ask Andrew to confirm with me in a moment but I think it's six would that be right? Six. 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 And of Deputy. those six which ones would be more serious? Could you give us of the six have you done an analysis of which yes, one would trouble you most? I think we've we've indicated that um, the two 
at the upper end of the scale in our view would be Waterford and GMIT, I think. Have I got that correct? Yeah. Sorry, I'm continually just checking my facts. I may, I may just comment briefly. So, so, yeah, in the financial review, we identified six that were particularly uh, vulnerable, Deputy. Um, I have to say, encouragingly, and, and also because of additional investment that was provided towards the end of the year for, for IOTs, Three of those institutes of technology are back in balanced budget. Now, now it's still a, a long-term challenge for them, but, but there are positive signs. However, there are three in particular. I'm going to concentrate on those three because okay. that's very welcome news about the three where there's encouragement. So you've yeah. named Ashley. I asked for the examples of which ones were most difficult. You mentioned two, and Waterford was one. Sorry, what was the other one? Uh, so we understand a GMIT going there. GMIT, and you said there was a third one. Well, the, um, the, the, the other vulnerable institution that has not yet been yeah. able to get back into balanced budget is IT Trilly. Now, now we have a meeting scheduled with them. And of those three, which one would be most concerning to you in relation to the scale of the deficit and, and the levels of adjustment that may need to be made? It, 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 would be, it would be WIT. WIT. Um, WIT. For, I suppose, that's interesting, then, that this is also the institute where there is concerns now about spin-out companies and whether the institute has been properly protected which is why there's, I'm, there, there is a focus on this. So you've now said that Waterford IT is possibly the one you have most concern about. Its core funding was cut. Um, 2008, its core funding was 40 million 134,000 in 2008. It was cut in 2016 to 26 million 460, which is quite a substantial drop. When the Secretary General of the Department was here, he said, Ah, Deputy, but that has been offset by a rise in fees. So the student contribution has gone up, so that should have offset it. The student fees in 2008 were 10 million 203,000. The student fees that were paid to Waterford in 2016 was 6 million. So they too decreased. So, in fact, the overall uh, um, contribution from the state, both in terms of fees and the core grounds, to WIT was 32,682,000 in 2016, as opposed to 50,338,000 in 2008. So if it's in such a deficit, isn't that one of the reasons why, if its funding has been cut that, that substantially, is that in the first instance the reason why it's in deficit? Again, I'll ask Andrew to comment. Um, Deputy, absolutely, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a major contributory factor. I mean, we're, we're talking about six vulnerable institutions, another four that are at risk from any further kind of financial decline or, or financial shock. So, yes, absolutely, the decline in funding has been a contributory so factor. To However, can, I, can, can I just expand yeah. slightly? However, what you've also seen in WIT is quite a significant decline in, in student numbers over the, the last few years. And there is also, I believe, an issue around the retention of students which go into WIT. And there is a plan in place uh, from the Institute to try to address those, um, those issues. OK, well, I have the uh, student numbers here, which doesn't shine with what you said. So we'll okay. just look at that. So in 2007, the student enrolments were 7,539. In 2015-16, it was 7,792, went up by 200. So it I think, seem to I me think that you, I think when you break problem. it down, you should see it go up and then go down from about 2013, 14. Yes. But you, when you look, you have to look back over a reasonable time period. So the starting time period I have is from 2007 and 2008. So yes, it kind of went up a little bit, but it it, it maxed up 8192. Or sorry, 8302 and went down to 7792. Yeah, a, a bit of a decline, but pretty much it remained static over an eight or nine year period. Would that be correct? That would be correct, yeah. but the serious financial issues would align with the, the drop off, certainly in, um, in enrolments and, um, and also, as you, as you point out, in the, the decline in funding per student, which is a very real problem for all institutes across the. I have two remaining questions, yeah, Kyle. Okay. So, um, Okay, so what we have acknowledged is that the core grant and the fees were quite substantially reduced into the institute. We have acknowledged that over a reasonable time period of seven or eight years, the enrolment figures have stayed pretty much static. We also know from the institute and from the department that the percentage of pay versus its funding is 87%, which is above the threshold. So what I'm putting to you is that, is it the case then that it was essentially departmental cuts to the institute that has led to it being in such a significant deficit, which is of concern 
to you, which has said it's the biggest concern to you in the first instance? Uh, and that's a, a question. And then in relation to a transition to a technological university, because this is one of the three can four consortium with Carlo, um, what um, funding model is being looked at for technological universities in respect of one, their ability to borrow, and two, baseline funding for research and development in comparison with, we'll say, existing universities. So what funding model has been examined? And will that help then all of these institutes in relation to the deficits that they have? So uh, I'll leave it at that then, Cahill, to be Thanks, fair Manchester. to the other. Take the, the last question first, uh, that's being looked at very specifically by the, the international panel that are looking at the funding model, and that has been raised, for example, the capacity to borrow has been a central feature of some of the submissions that the panel is considering. So that, that, that's on the cards, if you like, for the report that we'll hopefully buy, have by the end of Q2, end of June, etc. From from that perspective. In answer to your first question, which I think was, you know, is it is it lowering of financial input in effect while the, the student numbers are static? I think it's undoubtedly a significant contributor, isn't it? I mean, we can't can't step away from that. So that that's a, a statement of fact. And I suppose the, the other bit of context that I, I should have brought brought to your attention, I'm sure you're aware of it anyway, student numbers across the IoT sector over that period increased by about 24%. So if your numbers are relatively static or declining, you're, you're essentially obtaining a smaller and smaller share of the funding pot for institutes of and technology. And again, I just want to be clear to the witnesses, because I'm at pains to point this out, Kai Herlock, with yeah. respect to yourself, okay. on the issue of the intellectual property and spin-outs and so on, I completely get the need to incentivise researchers to engage in commercialising intellectual property, the benefits to the institute, the benefits to regions in relation to jobs, uh, and I at no point in any of the meetings have alleged or would allege any wrongdoing by any individual. But I think there is a need to make sure that the systems and the processes and the policies in place are robust enough to protect the, inst the, the institution at all times. And it seems from my record, and I don't know whether the controller is aware of the figures, but it seems to me that the institute started off in terms of one of the spin-out companies called Feed Henry, which was sold for 64 million, with started off with a shareholding of about 10% and ended up with a shareholding of about 2 or 3%. And that individuals who work for the Institute ended up getting more personally than the Institute itself. And on looking on the policy, it seems to suggest that the Institute should have a minimum of a 15% shareholding. So all I'm saying is that in all of these circumstances, we have to make sure, especially if we are being presented with the information from ourselves. Here's an institute which is in serious deficit, which is of concern to you. We have to make sure, in terms of all of its revenue streams, it is, its interest is being protected at all times. That's my only concern, if you can just take that, uh, those points on board. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, Cahill. Can I, yeah, just again, just a, a final, uh, on the kind of system issues that, that you're referring to there. Again, it would be at, not at all unusual internationally, and I have quite a bit of experience of this, for an institution's uh, benefit, if you like, Cheryl, to be diluted through the process of external money coming in to try and get a technology out to market, employ people, etc. Uh, there would be plenty of examples internationally where, where, where a shareholder that might start at 10 or 15 per cent would come down to 2, 1 per cent lower. What I think is really important for the system and for Ireland, and I say this as somebody who's worked in Science Foundation Ireland and, and Health Research Board and now in the HEA, what we need is to grow the number of instances so that there are many more one, two, three, and four, five percents helping the institutes in question and their area in the employment, etc. At a policy level. I call Deputy Connolly at 